which is going to um, prepare us for this Saturday night. Because, in fact, just a bit of an intro, we've been doing, with thanks to Anton and Hebrew Order of David, a seven-year course. A seven-year course, and tonight is, is the 46th class in that seven-year course, and I think it's very, very poignant and relevant. The whole point of the course is called the 49 Steps. It's connected to the different spiritual Kabbalistic spirit that you're meant to climb and ascend every day. And actually tonight, last night was 44. You know that, Anton? Yeah. Last night was 44. We're in the world of Malchus. We're in the world of royalty. We're in the world of getting to a place of total humility and, and, and to excel. This is what this week's about. This is what tonight's talk's about. It's to try and help us excel and, and make the best of your lives and be the best you can be. And tonight I'm going to give you a deep secret of how you can really excel spiritually based on, on the Sefirah Ta'omeh. And what you all need to know, I don't know if you're aware, this Saturday night is your wedding night. Do you know that? <laughs> according according <laughs> to Kabbalah, according to mysticism, and even though Anton's like, I'm married already? Yeah, wife doesn't mind. We get married again. We're getting married to God this time. We're getting married to Hashem. We're taught that we all get married to Hashem and Shabbat. What the... the Mount Sinai, and it says Hashem hovered a barrel over our heads. The mystics say, that's like the chuppah. That was like a chuppah. He, asked, he got us under the chuppah and said, will you marry me? He said, will you marry me? And, and hopefully we're going to say yes. I really recommend marrying Hashem. He's, he's, you know, he gives you a credit card. You know, he, 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 he gives you selfless love. Hashem gives us selfless love. And we get the Torah being part of the Jewish people. That contract of the Torah is, is a marriage. And that's what's going to be happening on Saturday night. But as tonight is Monday night, we have a few days to prepare. We have a few days to prepare. And, and we have to work out what we're meant to do between now and Shavuot to receive the spiritual energy coming down. Because the big mistake that some people make is to think that when we commemorate a festival, we're merely commemorating something which happened 3,300 years ago. However, the mystics say that's wrong. Yes, something happened 3,300 years ago. But things happen every single year on that night of the 6th of Sivan. On the night of the 6th of Sivan, there's going to be the Ten Commandments again coming to a world close to you. When it comes to sunrise, that's why we're going to stay up all night. We're going to stay up all night. And as soon as the sunrise comes out, that's when we're going to say the Ten Commandments. And for all of you sleeping, when you wake up, then you read the Ten Commandments. You've got all day to still read it. And that's going to be shovel work. But we have to prepare, just like you literally have to prepare for a wedding. We have to prepare for shovel work. So let's try and understand how we prepare between now and shovel work, apart from making cheesecake. Any of you like your cheesecake? You know, you're, Dan, you're not a cheesecake fan. Dan, you like your cheesecake? Or Hashem? My daughter is allergic to cheese. So she wants us to make a cheesecake without the cheese. Cheese. But you can make it like, it will look like cheesecake kind of taste like it-ish, but without the cheese. So uh, that's one of her goals for us. So that's one way to prepare for Shavuot, to prepare the cheesecake. But there's a much better way. And we're going to go into a deep Kabbalistic secret tonight, which I hope you're going to enjoy. It goes like this. The mitzvah that we meant to do between now, between Pesach and Shavuot, is called what? Sfirat HaOmer. Sfirat HaOmer means the counting of the Omer. Which, by the way, the Omer means the barley offering. We would offer up the barley offering straight after Passover. And for some reason, even now, we don't have a temple. We don't have offerings. We're mandated to count every night. It's the most interesting mitzvah. You literally spend the mitzvah. You know, normally a mitzvah is you put on tefillin or make you The mitzvah is to count. What an intriguing mitzvah. You know, and I'm not allowed to say what tonight's count is because that will take me out of the count. Because if you say it too early, prematurely, you haven't done the mitzvah. So what we say is, last night was 44. And then in a few hours' time, it's going to be the number after 44. But don't say it. Don't, don't say what the number after 44 is until a few hours' time. And then we're going to count it. So what is it this all about? And, and there's some very interesting paradoxical questions about counting of the Omer. And I'm going to give you two. Question number one. I'm going to give you a little bit of background. I'm not fishing for a muzzle tov. I'm going to ask for it anyway. Why? Because, thank God, last Sunday, amazingly, with Hashem's help, my daughter got engaged. Muffled off. 
And what's been interesting is, and I'm, I hope uh, my daughter doesn't mind me putting this on Facebook, whoops, but um, that's it, that shouldn't be daughter of a rabbi, that's, you know, we have to say our stories based on what happens in our family life. So essentially, they got kind of unofficially engaged already about 40 days ago. But the, my wonderful future son-in-law wanted to finish his finals and make sure everything was concluded so that he could focus exclusively on my wonderful daughter. How, how charming is that? And therefore, they had a count. And they had the most romantic, coolest count. What they did is they, I think it was like they had about 38 days till the day, last Sunday, 22nd of May, I think it was, when, when was their engagement. So they've been counting down. So every day they were like, you know, they had to send each other a picture, you know, with the number 38. And the next day was Sam's turn, 37. And my sister's, my, my daughter, not my sister, but my daughter, she's very happily married. My daughter <laughs> then would put 36, 35, and they'd be counting down. Five, four, three, two, one thing to go. Muzzle tov, we broke a plate. My wife did very well at breaking the plate at the engagement party, which is a very interesting custom. So, it sounds like a Greek custom, but it's actually a Jewish custom, right? and, and we, we break the plate. So they counted down. I don't know if any of you have ever been excited for something, like me personally. I've kind of put my hands up here. I probably wasn't, like school probably wasn't my finest moments. It's fair to say, I was a little bit, um, I liked my football, what can I tell you? I, was, I, was, I excelled at football. I excelled at playing football often during lesson time, and then I excelled at football. And I have to be honest, when it came to upper sixth then A-levels was going to finish in the last day of school, I have to confess the counting down, most definitely, you know, 10 days to go, five days to go, I probably like from 100 days I was counting, and I was 110 and five, and then one day to go. Can you imagine if I did it the other way around and worked out that my school, can anyone work out very quickly how many days, come on David, how many days if you're there from, let's say, for age four till 18, how many days is our school life? Right, so it's 365 times 14. Anyone can do that maths quickly? 365 15, times 14. 15,000. Oh, around 5,000-ish, so I just made it up. Right, let's call it around 5,000. Right, so can you imagine if we did it, that I was like, okay, that was day 4,975. Now, and I'm trying to get to 5,000, I'm counting up. You would no one would count up. Who counts up yet? Hashem asks us in the Torah that when it comes to the days between Passover and Shavuot, we count up instead of counting down. It's bizarre. You know, even on Channel 4, you've got a lovely program called Countdown. It's not called Count Up, right? It's called Countdown. Normally, we always count down. Why? Oh, why, oh, why? When it comes to preparing Shavuot, do we count up? Question number one. Question number two. The Bible says... How many days should you count? Anyone like to offer a guess? What do you think the Torah says of how many days you should count? 49. So I was going 49. 50. 40. You're going for 40. And so what do you think? Uh, 50 days. David, what does the Torah say? Seven weeks. Seven so the Torah doesn't say that. The Torah says in Hebrew, 40, 40, 40. Tisperu chamishim yom. Count 50 days. The Torah says count 50 days. Get in there, Yeshua. Buy a lottery ticket. Hold up. Right? Amen, amen. But you, don't right? count 50. but you don't count 50 days. It's a bizarre problem. The Torah asks us to count 50 days. But yet, we actually don't count 50 days. We count 49. We get to 49, and then we have the cheesecake the next night. Right? So we're counting all the way up. But ironically, the only day the Bible asks us to count, we don't count. So those are my two questions tonight. Why do we count up instead of counting down? And number two, why would the Torah ask us to count the 50th day, which we do anything but that? We count 49 days, but then we stop counting when ironically it comes to the 50th day. Those are my two questions. So let me give you a little bit of Kabbalah first before we get into the first part. There's two parts of tonight. This is the first part about the Omer, then we're going to talk about how to excel in our spiritual growth. So, a bit of Kabbalah for you tonight. The word in Hebrew always, the word in Hebrew gives away the essence of the reality of, of, of it. For example, the Ramban, Nachmanides, asks the question, he says, 
he believes Sfirat to Omer, the counting of the Omer, is not a time-bound mitzvah, which is really interesting, because there's this concept in Judaism, some commandments are time-bound, like Sukkot, like Tfilin, where you meant to end the day. Normally, a mitzvah which is relevant, germane to time, is called time-bound. Amazingly, Nachmanati says, counting of the Omer is not time-bound. And I spoke to a mystic last week, who, when I tried to find out the answer of why he says that, he says that when we count, we're actually forming time. That's the power of the count, which we're going to explain soon. Meaning words create reality. Words create reality. In, in, in English, a bottle of water is a description for this lovely Evian bottle. In Hebrew and in the Torah, if I was to say Mayim, that creates the reality called water. Mayim is the DNA of what water is. So we have to look at the Hebrew words. What's the Hebrew word for the word Omer? Ayin Mem Resh. The numerical value is 310. Why is 310 an important number? Anyone can think? This is a hard one. You've got to be a bit of a black belt Kabbalist to know about 310. Half which Anton one. is? I'm not. Uh, you learned Nefesh Achai, so half go on. Of, half of 620. Half of 620. What's 620? 613 with 613 plus. plus seven days of the week. Or, uh, maybe, maybe uh, days of creation. Go on. The Noah. Seven. So, so the seven the six hundred and twenty commandments that God has commanded humanity. It's commanded the Jewish nation six one three. It's funny, people think there was just ten commandments. Uh sorry, that's just the name of the film, right? But there was another six hundred and three as well. Yes, we had ten commandments. We have Ten Commandments, but that wasn't all the story. There's another 603 if you read, if you read the, the Constitution. But the Jewish people get 613. Our non-Jewish brothers and sisters get 7, what I call 007. They get the 007, they get the 7 of our That means in totality we have 620 commandments, which the mystics, by the way, explain, the Ramchal explains, that there's 620 spiritual lights out there that we meet, we're meant to turn on these spiritual lights. 620 lights. <clears throat> so why 310 is Omer? Because my friends, there's a Mishnah in Uksin, the last very Mishnah of all the Mishnahs. In Shas, there's a Mishnah, a tractate called Uksin, the very last Mishnah says a very mystical idea. It says when we go to the next world, if you've succeeded in turning on your lights, you get 310 worlds. You get 310 worlds. What does that mean? Very hard. I can't even know where to begin. If the next world is you and Hashem, so essentially you get this 310 different connections to Hashem. And each world has its own reality, has its own love, has its own happiness. So we're getting 310 gateways to happiness and love and light. And the Omer is 310. Meaning, what we're doing when we're counting the Omer, we're spiritually trying to access our higher potential. This is what we're meant to be doing every night. We're trying to work on something else, work on something else, work on something else, work on something else, and trying to build a story, to build your story. In fact, the word for sphira is the same word in Hebrew as safer, a book. Counting and book is the same. Because by counting, you're writing your book. By, by coming tonight, for those of you who've actually, like Anton, have actually come to every single one of the past 45 talks, now tonight's 46. You're building a story. You're building, you're building, you're building, you're building, you're building. It's accumulating. You're accumu accumulating spiritual wealth. So why 310, not 620? You're with me. Again, the word in Hebrew for crown, keser, chaf, taf, reish, comes to 620. There's 620 mitzvahs. So why don't we get 620 worlds? Why 310? Because we're a pair. Because either we're a pair male or female, or we're a pair with Hashem, which is the ultimate male or female, that's why it's a marriage with Hashem. Meaning Hashem has half the worlds and we have half the worlds. Our job, should you choose to take it, your mission, is to develop a relationship with Hashem. Therefore, every let's say you excel in the mitzvah of charity. That means you share your charity world with Hashem. Hashem has his charity world, and then you get access, and it's you're joined to the hip, so you can become part of that light, you can become part of that 
essence of charity in the next world. Similarly, if you honour your parents. So Hashem has half the spiritual delights of that area, and then you have half that area. So essentially, the 310 is your spiritual part in the world to come. And that's what the Spirit of Omer is doing, if you count it correctly. So now we start understanding why it is that we count up and we don't count 50. The reason is the following. When you count down, it's because it's all about the destination. When I left school, I just wanted to get out and not be harassed by teachers anymore. Couldn't wait and play football whenever I wanted and be free. So I was, that was my destination. So I was counting down, you know, when my daughter, when Dina was counting to get engaged to Sam, she just wanted to be engaged. So, let's listen to this. It's, it's the count which is our destination. Say that again. It's the count which is our destination. I'll give you an example. Let's say you want to get very fit. So if you want to start running a marathon, anyone's interested in stopping? Anyone run a marathon before? Half a marathon? Would like to fantasize about it? Right, so imagine, yeah, I can see Dan's got it in him, right? So Dan's going to please God, I'll give you the blessing to, to run a marathon then, right? So for you to do that, for you to get to a place of 25 miles, you don't go on the road and start running 25 miles. Slowly, first of all, you buy the shoes, you buy the trainers, you know, you do a bit of stretching. And then maybe, if you're lucky, you have a little job. And then you have to start training up. Probably day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. Going from half an hour to an hour to an hour and a half to two hours to two and a half hours to three hours. And then before you know it, all that accumulation gets you to now be able to run a marathon. If you want to live in your 310 worlds with Hashem and be, be at one with Hashem, we need to build up slowly. Day in, day out, day in, day out. Put it a different way. Anyone play music? Any of you play music? If you play music, how many notes on the scale? Anyone? Seven. Seven. Seven notes mm-hmm. on the scale. Which, by the way, according to the Maharal, according to Kabbalah, that's not a random coincidence either. As Elliot said before, there's seven days of the week. Seven notes on the scale, Kabbalistic, the seven colors of the rainbow, the seven dwarfs in Snow White, which isn't relevant, the Maharaj doesn't say that part, <laughs> right? But, 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 but seven is, is the spectrum of, of nature. Hashem relates to us via nature in the number seven. Eight is transcendence. <clears throat> That's why a, a Jewish baby boy has circumcision eight days. Hanukkah, the miracle, is eight days. Shmone. The word shmone also means neshama, soul. What am I saying? So like this, seven notes on the scale, if you play one note at a time, and you go plink, and then plonk, and then plonk, plink, plonk, plink, there's no, there's no music. What creates the music? When you're playing all the notes at the same time consecutively, the, the, the notes with the note, with the note, with the note, you know, when you're playing that on my left finger and, and the chords all coming together, you don't play music, you play notes. But the notes only create the music when it's accumulative. You know, I found a quote from Aristotle, which he actually stole from Torah for a change. Any real wisdom is taken from Torah. And he said the famous quote, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Very deep. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's why, my friends, we don't count the 50th day. Do you know what the 50th day is? It's all the 49 days. The combination of all the 49 days, that is the 50th day. You become, you become the count. You've achieved running the marathon. If you do the the work enough to get you to that fitness level, you're ready. Are you with me? Again, if someone wants to have a good example, a successful marriage, it's not just getting married. It's the day in, day out, day in, day out. Working on communication, acts of kindness, compromise. Right, Anton? 
It's, it's, it's not the big gestures. It's the small things. As my wife always say, it's the small things that count. It's the small things that count. If you want to work on developing an everlasting, eternal relationship with Hashem, it's the small things that count, my friend. That's why it's so important to live in the moment. Right now, the Yitzhara sidetracks us and thinks, oh, but, but if only I got there, if only I had that, then I'd be happy. No. If we learn just to focus on the moment right now, we should just be learning spirituality together. So let's just focus on it. It's Monday night, the 44th day of the Omer still. We're just experiencing the now because by building on every now, that's when you get to an amazing destination. That's what Spirit of Omer is about, my friends. It's about every day building your spiritual muscles. Doing a small act every day. You know, I started a custom, which I recommend to you. That every day before I pray, three times a day, I just give charity. So now I'm not just praying three times a day, I'm giving charity three times a day. And then on Shabbat, I can't give charity. So before Shabbat and after Shabbat. So all of a sudden, if I'm praying every day, three times a day, that's 21 a week. Now I'm giving charity. And basically 20 times a week, because you know, twice before Shabbat and after Shabbat. It, it builds you. All of a sudden, you start becoming more charitable because it becomes part of yourself. But it's those small things. What is the uh, definition of giving charity? Physically taking money out of your pocket or, or what? Because if you go to school and you have an year and, and they shoulder, you're giving, you undertake to pay or uh, give a certain amount. I, I, so I, our result says we need to put our hands in our pocket and just put a coin in a box or in someone's hand. <coughs> acts of charity. Obviously, a pledge is great, also, and, and then eventually, when you pay that pledge, that's also an act of charity per se. But our result says we need to train ourselves just to become active givers. Kabbalistically, it's to do with Hashem's name. The Yud of there's the classic name of Hashem, and the Yud and the Hay and the Vav and the Hay. The Yud that our result says is the coin. The Hay is the hand you put in your pocket. The Vav is your outstretched arm, and the Hay is the hand of the other person giving. You know, one of the shows I go to in Gold is Green. One of the shows I go to in Gold is Green, they really like completing Hashem's name because every minute someone's knocking on your shoulder saying, can I have, can I have, can I have, can I have, please? It is, and, I, and I like, I, I get start feeling bad because I can, there's only a certain amount of change I bring and then, and then what can I do? So they've, they've come up with a brilliant tactic now. They have credit card machines. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming out with credit card machines. <laughs> Which is very clever, very clever. My wife's a bit nervous about me giving out credit card, my credit card to anyone, any Tom, Dick and Harry. But, um, but on the other hand, they're trying to complete Hashem's name with the credit card machine. You know, you buy, you buy that, that's the credit, you know, that's the hey, that's the final hey, that's the, the modern way of completing. But what I'm getting at is, if you give one, once in your life, you give a million, million pounds. Nice. Or a million times in your life, you give one pound. No doubt, says Rabbi Desler, you're way more a charitable person doing that million actions of, 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 of a pound. Because you every time you give, it's an erosion of ego. It, it, it's an act of giving. You're emulating Hashem. You're, you're developing your spiritual muscles. If you give that once, it's an amazing act. But it was one act that doesn't define you. The Mishnah Pragi always says you're defined by your majority of your actions. I should learn that in Tali this morning. You're, you're judged by the majority of your actions. That means scary. If someone's an angry person and they're shouting and they're, and they're being rude and they've got road rage and they're irritable and they're impatient and then once a day they're being kind to someone. That's not great. It's got to be the other way around. It's got to be, you know, you see someone at work. Hi, good morning. How are you? You open the door for someone. You want to go make your cup of tea. Can I make you something? Those small acts, you know, when you're driving, letting someone go in front of you. You know, it's funny, sometimes when I'm, when I'm in a rush, I hold my hands up. Sometimes that's one of my Yitzhahoras. You know, one of my evil inclinations where I'm in a rush and I'm, I, and I'm not as calm as I should be. And I need to get into a headset. Even if, if I'm in a rush, it's an opportunity to do mitzvahs even when you're driving. Letting someone go in front of you and, and, and not getting stressed, not getting road rage, letting pedestrians walk in front. So what we're saying tonight is the reason that we don't count the 50th day, is you are the 50th day. The counting of all the 49th days is the 50th day. It's, it's all the notes. If you, anyone make a poem, anyone ever made a poem? Any poets in the room down here are poets? Right? And you know it? Right, so, 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 when you don't write a poem, you write letters. One letter, then another letter, 
but then another letter and another letter, and another letter, and they form words, and the words form would form a poem. That's what the count is. It's it's creating you. It's building your spiritual muscles. Any questions before I go on? And again, that's why we count up, because we're trying to reach Hashem. So it's like you're like, like on a ladder, right? We're going up one rung, another rung, another rung, another rung, and then getting to the end, now I can touch Hashem. Do you understand? It's not, we're not counting down, God forbid, because then we're getting further away from Hashem. You're counting up towards Hashem, then now I'm closer. Every day I'm closer, I'm closer, I'm closer. It's an amazing thing for those... You know, David, I think you, you, you're managing, thank God, to, to still do 44 days. It's the bizarre thing, just getting, doing it every day, day in, day out, saying Hashem's name. It's building you without you realizing it. It's unconscious building. It's going to be really strange next week when we don't have to count anymore. It's going to be like something's missing in my life. Because it, it creates routine. It creates discipline. It creates prioritizing Hashem. For me, it's been really hard on a Friday night when I'm not in synagogue, trying to remember, saying to my wife, don't, don't, don't let me forget. Don't let me forget. Because during the week, you're in synagogue when we count there. And yet on Friday night, we're at home and you're eating with your family. You've got to remember when it gets three stars coming out, don't forget to count. And that's always, it's interesting. It shows how much am I thinking of Hashem in my life. That's one of the ideas of the counting the Omer. Essentially, on, on a marriage analogy, it's, it's a bit of a litmus test. Hashem is saying, you want to marry me? Let's see if you think if you can think of me. It's a bit like when people date. Let's be honest, the dating's a trial. Are you into me? Is she into you know, are you thinking of me? Are you being considerate? Are you being kind? Are you are you a giver? And my only my, my wife always says, the most important thing she wants, like little understatement. She makes it like sing see it's easy. So wherever I am in the world, my priority is her. How easy is that? But in a way, Hashem wants that as well. That's what Hashem wants. Hashem wants whatever we are, whatever we're doing, we're connecting to our spirituality. We're connecting to Hashem. So now, that's the first part. The second part, I'm going to take it up a notch. How are we going to achieve it? What, what is the secret to succeeding? What is the secret to achieving excellence, to achieving oneness, to achieving you becoming the best you can be? So actually last week, we had a, the parsha. And you want to remember what was the parsha last week? Chukotai. The Chukotai. What does it say, the first three words? Do you know Shira? Come on, you said the name so nicely. <laughs> David? <laughs> In the Chukotai, Teilechum. Which means, God said, if you walk in my laws, if you walk in my laws, and keep my mitzvot, then I'll make it rain in your time, by the way, it's a very interesting thing. We must be so holy in London, it's raining every day here. It's awesome, right? In the mm. summer, hey, how holy mm. are we? But it actually doesn't say it will rain every day. It says rain in your time. What does it mean, your time? What do you think it means, raining in your time? So actually, raining in your time means that when Mashiach comes, it's only going to rain two nights a week. Do you know that? Anyone guess? Friday night. Friday night, and I'll be really impressed if anyone gets this. Even though you've got one out of six. You know, you've got a what, 15% chance. So Friday night's going to rain. In addition to, in addition to Friday night, what's the other night's going to rain? Come on, we've got one out of six. Guess. Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anton smashed it. What's the answer? I have no idea why. Good man. Why? Why Tuesday? I got married on Tuesday night. Same reason. <laughs> Meaning? It's, it's the, that's the night the Torah says, it's very good, it's very good. Kitok, kitok. There's a spiritual energy on a Tuesday night. But with that comes a downside. Whenever there's a spiritual boost, you have the other side that are allowed to compete. Which means, and it's an amazing thing, the Kabbalists say, many demons are allowed to cause problems on a Tuesday night. I don't know if any of you have had hassle on a Tuesday night, right? But that's why people aren't going to be on the streets when Mashiach comes on a Tuesday night. They're going to be indoors. So you're indoors on a Tuesday night, you're indoors on a Friday night. That's when it's going to rain. Rain shouldn't be uncomfortable. Rain shouldn't. Rain, rain is a blessing, but it's the ultimate blessing if you don't get wet as well. Awesome. <coughs> so that's what it says in this week's Sedra. In the Chukotai Teilechu. So the question Rashi asks is, what is this word Chok? It should. It, we we said already in that first verse, if you keep the mitzvot, 
So then why say if you walk in the laws? In the chukotaiti means if you walk in the laws. What does it mean if you walk in the laws? What does that mean? As you walk in a law, you know, I've got my friend here, David, is a lawyer. You don't walk in a law. You keep the law, one hopes. In order to keep your study. But what does it mean to walk in the law? How does that mean to walk? How b'chukotai te'ilechu? Should have said b'chukotai tishmaru. If you observe the law, if you keep the law, not if you walk the law. What does it mean to walk the law? You walk the plank. You yeah. don't walk the law. You How do you walk you. the law? You take, you take them with you. What does that mean? Wherever what, you go. How do I walk tefillin, right? You, you put on tefillin. I don't walk tefillin. For what, that's a law. We talk about giving charity. You give charity. You don't walk charity unless you go for it. How you live your life is walking your Very life. Very good. Nice. So, so it goes like this. And I think there's a nice definition, you know, you know, David very kindly gave me a lift tonight. So I was able to come nice and relaxed. I wasn't in traffic like Anton. He, he actually used his ways to get us around the traffic. He's right. It's an amazing thing where he's right. I definitely wasn't exerted. Tiredness. I got a lift. My dear friends, in life, spiritually, we try and get lifts too, much, too often. We try and get someone else to do the heavy, heavy lifting. Hashem saying, you do the walking. You've got to put the work in. If you want to grow spiritually, you know, you can't become a marathon runner by someone else doing the running as much as we'd like to. You've got to put the work in. You've got to put the work in. If you want to become charitable, you've got to give the charity. You know, when Anton's running this amazing charity, unfortunately for Anton, it's actually not unfortunate, it's fortunately for you, there's a lot of hard work. It's not easy. You get stressed. It's a headache because nothing... Good comes easy. The fun sara agra, according to the effort, is the reward. So you've got to put work in. That's why it says work. But what type of work it says? Rashi. It's specifically about learning Torah. It says it's referring to toiling in Torah. It says, Have a made in Torah. You need to toil when you learn Torah, and then you get rewarded. That's the secret. So why? That's the question. Like tonight, to be fair, you're probably not yet toiling. You're listening, I'm hoping. And I'm hoping, you know, maybe it's hard to listen to me. I apologize if it's really hard. If this is like a really, you know, you've got other things to do, you've got other programs to watch, you know, and you're choosing to, to listen to the rabbi. But I'll be honest with you, when you get upstairs, you can't say, Hashem, I just sat there listening to Rabbi Hill and it was really hard work and you've got to reward me because, you know, that was exhausting. <laughs> I, I personally think he's so boring, right? I, I really think that, that you're not going to get away with that, I'm afraid, right? Because it's good. You know, your insurance, like, I stayed awake. Not enough. This is toiling. Uh, right, not, uh, huh? This is toiling. Uh, it shouldn't be, mate. Right, I'll take you to Shiva and I'll show you toiling. <laughs> toiling is, mate. <laughs> toiling is, you sit down, a piece of Talmud, which I now do with David on, on, on Friday mornings, and I make you toil. I say, what does this mean? And he's like, okay. I say, what does it really mean? And before you know it, he's troubled and he's now got to think and he's got to think and he's got to think. And, he, and he, the, uh, I'll let you know it's a bit of a secret. <clears throat> Probably shouldn't say this. I hope don't punch me. One day in Yeshiva in Israel, <laughs> probably the day more than any day of my life, there was a piece of Talmud that was really hard. And I said, that's it. I'm just like, I'm not going to go to sleep tonight till we've worked it out. And me and my Harissa, we just literally all day long, we're just toiling away and we're asking for that position, that position, we're checking loads of other books and we're literally grappling and grappling and like trying to work out a conundrum. We're trying to, you know, people who have tried to memorize things and you, we're just working so hard at it and and then literally by the two in the morning we were like, okay, we did our best. I promise you, I went to sleep. I don't know how or what but someone came in my dream and gave me the answer. I don't know who it was. And I woke up knowing the answer. And I remember the dream. And, and, and the mystics explain, when you toil, when you really, really, really graft, then you get the blessing. Then Hashem opens it up for you. You've got to put the work in. In other words, too many people pick when they learn Torah. They say, ah, let's find it easy. I watch it online, and you should watch it online. It's good to watch it online. But what I'd recommend for all of you and all of you listening, if you really want to excel in the learning of Torah, which is the number one 
mitzvah, of all the 613 mitzvah, which is really what Shavuot is about. It's about you receiving your portion, portion in Torah. Toil. Work hard. Find something which you're interested in, but it's not easy. A book which, okay, how am I going to learn this? And maybe you need a friend to learn it with. Or a teacher to learn it from. And you literally graft. Like if any of you, if you remember when you were in university or got projects to do, which is not easy. It's like, it's just, Hashem wants to see you sweat. Sorry to say. He wants to see those sweat beads come. He wants to see you exhausted afterwards. You, want, you know, sometimes I'll be honest, when I give a class, I try and put a lot, and I get exhausted afterwards. That's good. But Hashem wants to see you guys exhausted as well. Not from this class, but from your own spiritual learning yourselves. There should be at least once a week when you delve into an area of Jewish learning, which is not easy, and you're like, okay, how am I going to understand this? And you try, and you try, and you open up books, and you ask Hashem for help, and you maybe call up people like there was something that last night. You know, I started this new book, you're all welcome to join me, called Duties of the Heart. And it's very deep, very Kabbalistic, very complex, I've never really learned it before. And I started preparing it, it's like, whoa, what's he saying here? And I had to call up some of my rabbis and look in books to really work it out. I had to, had, had to, the sweat. And it's amazing when you sweat, then you get blessed time and time again. And that's what we're learning from last week's etc. There's a piece of Gemara, in fact, uh, yeah, there's a piece of Gemara in Yuma, Tractate Yuma, page 35, which says the following. You see, we, the Jewish people, have got the best excuses under the planet. Does anybody know that? We're the master of excuses. When we get to the next world, we come up with the best excuses why we we didn't do that. You know, I've got so many students to say to me, Rabbi, when I get married, I'm going to have a kosher kitchen. <laughs> it's really impossible now. It's really impossible. When I get married, I have a kosher kitchen. So I'm very excited. You know, I help, I help them. I get them married. A week later, I'm around. You're only coming to help with the cook. When we have kids, we thought about it. When we have kids, you know, the kid comes. When they're bar mitzvah. It's amazing how people find excuses Delaying when it comes to learning, people will say, oh, so stressed, so busy, got COVID, got long COVID, got short COVID, right? Everyone will have so many excuses, so many excuses. So the Gemara says the following amazing, scary story. Sorry to scare us. I want to share with you this piece of Talmud because it really is going to help you achieve excellence in your life. And the Talmud says like this. There's going to be this big courtroom in the next world. And Hashem is there, we come to the courtroom. So the person that's poor, if he comes in and pledges that the reason I didn't learn, the reason I wasn't able to spiritually grow, I was, God, it's your fault you made me poor. You know, it's your, it's your fault, God. You know, I had to like, you know, I was on benefits. I was, you know, things were tough. You know, I had to sweep the floor. You know, I, I had time. How could I have time to go and do all these mitzvahs? Impossible. You know, I've got to pay the bills. It's your fault, God. If you would have wanted me to, 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 to be able to spiritually grow, you'd have made it a bit easier for me. You made it impossible. It's way too poor. I shouldn't have said that. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. I've got someone I want to, you to meet. And I said I was going to bring someone from heaven. Do you know who's going to bring? My namesake. Hillel. The Talmud says Hillel comes out. I said, Hillel, can you come and have a chat with these people, please? Hillel, tell, tell a poor person in front how you lived your life. Hillel was one of the poorest people on the planet. Hillel was one of our great spiritual sages who wrote the Mishnah, who was so poor, he worked for a week and only received one traffic every week. That was the currency in those days, called a traffic. And 50% of that traffic, half a traffic, he had to pay to the synagogue to allow him to learn. It was a time when you had to pay to get into the synagogue. Like today, the membership, right? In, in that time, they had to pay. And can you imagine giving up 50% of your income for Judaism? We cry our eyes out at 10%. And everyone, Rabbi, really, do I really have to do the 10? You know, are you sure it doesn't mean 10? Are like, sure, like, five's enough? Can you imagine giving 50%? 50%! You can imagine, 50% goes to Hashem. Hillel gave 50%. Sometimes he didn't have enough, he just didn't have enough. So what he did was, one winter's night, 
when he really wanted to know what was going in. He, he wanted a toilet tower. He was so excited to learn. Do you know what he did? On the roof. He did a bit of a Spider-Man and started scaling the roof. Started scaling the roof of the synagogue to listen in to what they were saying by the roof. And in the morning, they found him frozen to the window. And that's when they changed the policy. And Hashem is going to say, Hillel was pretty poor and he managed to become Hillel. He managed to achieve excellence. So then the, the wealthy man comes in. And the wealthy man says in, Hashem, first of all, thank you so much for blessing me with wealth. But you obviously knew as a consequence of that, I'm busy, you know, as a CEO, director of many charities. And the phone didn't stop. Emails didn't stop. I did my best, you know. I was able to learn a bit here and a bit there. But don't, you know, don't ask me to achieve spiritual excellence. You know, you gave me financial distractions. I was super busy. Shem's going to say, oh, really? You're complaining. You're a billionaire. You're complaining. Okay. Of course. I don't expect anything less. And he brings in a rabbi called Rabbi Elezer ben Kharsom, says the Mishnah, says the Gemara. Rabbi Elezer ben Kharsom was a great rabbi who was one of the wealthiest men on the planet. He owned, apparently, half of the ships of the world. And yet, he found day in, day out, time to become the great sage he became. He was on his way to the ships he was learning, in the ships he was learning. Oh, he didn't stop learning. He didn't stop learning. For all you handsome young men in front of you, you're going to say to God, Hashem, how did you expect me, you know, to go to, to Shears, you know, to get married to one woman? I was being chased by thousands of women every day, you know? Joseph. So that's what Danny told me the problem, right? So, so you know, I've got these thousands of women are chasing me every... Hey, you made me so handsome, God. You made me this star. What do you expect from me? You know, how do you expect me, you know, just to, to be focused and, and, and to be able to learn every day and to be able to be uh, exclusive to one woman? I didn't have a chance, you know. I, you know, Tinder every day, everyone's, everyone's you know, clicking me and, 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 and swiping me. I'm being swiped right, left and centre. What chance do I have, Hashem? What chance do I have? I'm sure some of you can feel this pain, this problem. So, do you know who Hashem sends out? Who, 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 who was Joseph. the king in the Bible? Joseph. Very good. Well done, Els. Yosef Atzadik was one of the most handsome men of all time. <clears throat> Yosef Joseph, one of the most handsome men of all time. In fact, there's an amazing piece of Midrash. You know, I don't know if any of you saw the program. What's it called in my youth? Something like Housewives? Something about Housewives? Mm. Anyone? What's it called? It's about Desperate Housewives or something? Mm -hmm. Right? Where these housewives are sitting around, you know thinking about men, but apparently it was in the Bible as well. And it says that Potiphar's wife used to sit with her friends and they used to talk about the beauty of Joseph. And she used to say, I can't tell you how depressed I am. They said, why are you depressed? Because I've got the most handsome man in the world in my house and he's not interested in me one bit. And I'm seeing him and I just do my head in. I'm having a breakdown. And they said, how bad can it be? And she said to them, come round one day. And they came round, that's what the, the Midrash says, they came round one day, they're sitting in the kitchen, and she's like literally weeping, you know, and she's just distraught. And he walked in, into the kitchen. Joseph walked in, and all of a sudden there was silence in the room. <laughs> they all looked up, and no one could breathe. And apparently Potiphar's wife cut her hand at the time, she was like cutting onions, and she forgot about the onions. And she started cutting her fingers and started bleeding everywhere. So he was so good looking. There was no one more good looking than Yosef. And yet, when Potiphar's wife tried it on with him, he ran out. He did a runner. He said, no way. And he, and he, and he managed, and he knew he was going to get to prison as a result. But he managed to ward her off. And he brings out Yosef and says, if he managed to become Joseph and to become one of the greatest righteous spiritual giants of all, and he was the most handsome man of all time, if he would be on t t Tinder, he'd be, you know, swiped more than any. No, I'm saying that Yosef was on Tinder, but I'm just saying if, right? <laughs> then, and he managed to become the Tzadik, then who, however handsome you are, however much of a stud you think you are, you could have overcome it as well. So you start seeing from the Talmud, whatever excuses we throw, one of the most um, inspirational moments of my life was meeting 
very, very great mystic. He was the Rosh Hashiva of the Miri Yeshiva. His name was Rav Nosson Svi Finkel. Rav Nosson Svi Finkel was a legend. And I think maybe 30 years before the end of his life, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. But he had a very severe Parkinson's disease. Very, very ill. Very sick. And the doctors wanted him to take some serious medication. And he looked, when he looked at the medication, he said, if I take this medication, I'm going to forget some of my Torah. So I don't want to take it. And when I used to go and see him, he was shaking around, like a lulu. He was just shaking, shaking, shaking. Sometimes uncontrollably shaking. And yet, he still retained his, his Torah, and he would give one of the biggest daily Talmudic discourses, day in, day out, in the Miri Yeshiva, between 12 and 1 o'clock, day in, day out. One of my <clears throat> friends from my synagogue that I attend, called Meir, told me when he had to go to be tested by him, to get into the Miri Yeshiva, he wasn't prepared, and he walked into the room, and he sees this great spiritual giant shaking, and he said he, he couldn't concentrate, he was so put off, he totally went blank. And the Rosh Hashiva said, come back tomorrow. When he came back tomorrow, he was a bit more composed, and he managed to get in. So what I'm saying is, you saw this spiritual giant, and, and yet he didn't, for a moment, go slow. Too many people, we're not feeling well, we're muddy cuddled in today's generation, I'm sorry to say, you know? We've never had some more, more help and homeopathic help and, and you know, different types of medications and our, and our therapists. And, and yet, we're still complaining right, left and centre. And, and, and we, we, we stop making that effort. You see someone like Renaissance Lee Finkel and he kept on going. He was travelling from country to country with Parkinson's. He, he kept on being a spiritual giant for the Jewish people. There was one shear apparently he gave. When he gave the shear, it had more impact than most shears they've ever been to. Rav Chalaf Tera says when he was sitting in the shear, Rav Nosson Svi Finkel got up and he's shaking uncontrollably and he got so ill, he had to sit down and he's now sitting down. He beckoned for one of the students to bring a pen to him. He had a pen and paper and wrote on the paper two words. Slicha misiti. Sorry I tried. And the whole shiva felt such an overwhelming sense of the importance of Judaism, the importance of Torah learning, that someone was just going through the pain barrier for the sake of learning. It, it, it changed their lives. They said those two words changed their lives more than many of his talks. A certain point of his life, he turned to one of his students, Rukhan Akhtela, and said to him, sometimes I ask, why do you think Hashem gave this to me? He wasn't complaining. He was, you know, he was such a great man. He was trying to figure it out. What was, what was the spiritual point? So Rav Teller said, uh, who knows, Rabbi, but maybe one thing. That piece of Talmud that we just quoted, that if you're poor, Hillel Machai Bishanir, Hillel obligates the poor people. If you're rich, Rabbi Ezeb and Harsoy, Machai Ashirim, he obligates the rich people. If you're very handsome and, and you're in demand, Yosef obligates you to be on form. Maybe you, Rosh Hashiva, obligate the people who are sick. That even if you're sick, you can still, still keep trying. Somehow, keep trying. You know, my father, Father Bashanam, he, he was first diagnosed with cancer about seven years ago. And that for the first phase of cancer he had, which he had, he had the six phases of chemotherapy. And on his last chemo, the hospital called me one day and said, Avi, you've got to come around. You've got to speak to your dad. And I was like, oh, this doesn't sound good because he was really sick. The sixth chemo knocked him. He was in hospital. He... And the nurse, I came into the hospital. The nurse says, you've got to speak to him like on that. You're the doctor. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Like, what are you? I say, come and have a look. Come here. And they took me to the UCH hospital. My father had made the waiting room into a yeshiva. And, and he was learning with one of the guys. And one of the other guys was waiting for them to finish and then they swapped. And he, wasn't, he was there all day. <laughs> and like, get him to bed. He's like, he's not listening to us. Can you ask him to go to bed? But my father didn't let his illness slow him down. He had such love. For his Judaism, he had such love for learning Torah. 
He didn't let his sickness stop him. I would often take him home from chemo, and he would say, why are we going home? It's time we've got to go to shul. You see, on the way back from chemo, he wants to go to shul because he didn't change his routine. Right at the very end, he was so ill. He literally was, he was totally delirious. And he's speaking to me about, I've got a lesson this afternoon. I'm not sure if I can do it. Maybe you can email. He was just thinking of his students. He was thinking of his Torah because he managed to get this level of excellence that he understood. We're here to toil in Torah. Just because you're not well, just because we're tired, just because things are inconvenient, just because of the cost of living crisis, just because there's a war with Ukraine and, and Russia, doesn't mean that we stop. Doesn't mean that we stop growing. Here's the secret. You want to grow spiritually, you've got to sweat. Can't be easy. You've got to get to a place of total exhaustion sometimes. That's when miracles happen. That's when the amazing happens. Hashem wants to see how much do you want it. You see, there's a famous question. It says... In the Talmud, in Kiddushin, it says, Rabbi Yaakov Ba'idi, the reward for your spiritual actions on in this world. It's not as simple as you're learning Torah today, you gave charity today, you're going to become a billionaire. It doesn't work like that. We know it doesn't become like that. It's not as simple as that. The reward for your mitzvah is in the next world. Mitzvahs are infinite. You'll only be rewarded for that infinity in the world of infinity. However, in last week's Sedra, it says you will be blessed. You will receive blessings. Says the Nesim Shalom. Do you know when you receive the blessing? Not for doing the mitzvah, but for sweating in the mitzvah. If you go that extra mile and you walk and you get exhausted. You know, Anton, when he made an amazing barbecue. Was it last night? I am convinced there was a lot of work behind the scenes. To prepare, to clear up. I've got news for you. It was the exhaustion of preparing that made it good. That brings the blessing from heaven. That's what makes the success. <clears throat> Sometimes in life, we want to enjoy the spiritual moments without the effort. It doesn't work that way. The miracle happens through immense self-sacrifice and effort. My Rebbe Rebbe always says to me, if you want to have success in life, you've got to have what's called Mesiris Nefesh. Mesiris Nefesh means... A lot of self-sacrifice. You've got to sometimes sacrifice things. You, 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 you've got to give up things. You've got to get to it. He doesn't sleep. This great rabbi, he literally, 2 o'clock till 4.30, that's when he sleeps. He wants to get up before sunrise and get ready, and he's up till 2. He manages in two and a half hours sleep. How? I don't know. But that's why amazing things happen through him. So he always said to me, Miss Nimrus Nefesh, so what happened to me about five years ago, I was in between jobs, and I said to Hashem and Rosh Hashanah, Hashem, Hashem, I'm prepared. I'm prepared to sacrifice for you. I'm prepared to have the most sent Nefesh for you. Help me find a community that I can help. Anyway, a few weeks later, this great rabbi's in town in London, and I go for a blessing. He says, oh, come to Israel, come to Tel Aviv. There was a problem. I was in between jobs. I didn't have the money to pay for a flight. I didn't have the money to pay for a hotel. So I found the cheapest flight home. And I went on bookings.com and I found the cheapest place to stay in Jerusalem I could. And I said, sure, I'm coming. So I come and I go and take my bags to this cheapest location in bookings.com in Jerusalem. <sighs> Don't do that, everybody. I understand. I walk into this... <laughs> Hostel. <hut. laughs> it was kind of a hut in a farm. I think... And, 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 and there was like a straw bed, and there was animals surrounding me, hens, chickens, lots of cats. And I'm there lying on this hay bed, and at a certain point, I get up and say, Hashem, I think you misunderstood me. When I said I'm prepared to sacrifice, I didn't mean that much. You know, I wasn't really up like lying with animals in the room. I think you misunderstood me. You think you think you think you're more spiritual. I'm, I'm not as spiritual as that, but on the funny, on the on the other hand, I do believe that that's what Hashem wants. Sometimes He wants you to go out of your comfort zone. It's about getting out of your comfort zone. We love our comfort zone. I've got news for you. You can't grow spiritually within your comfort zone. You've got to at times find that supernatural strength, and that's when the miracles happen in your life. And that's what we're learning. That's what the spirit count is about. And I'll just finish on one last idea. How do you achieve it? How do you achieve that? So God tells you how to achieve it. It says in the Shema, 
Hashem says, Be your half toast, Hashem and a kecha, the whole of Bovko, the whole Nafshko, the whole Medecha. You should love Hashem with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your finance, with all your everything, with every breath. If you really want to grow, how much do you want it? And here's the problem in life you're prepared to expand energy and expand energy in the areas that you really care about. But often we're not caring about the right things. How many of us love our car? Our car. Our car. Our, 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 our castle. Or oh, God forbid someone scratches. I'll be honest, you know, last week, I mean, I'm going kind to of share this story. I'm driving in Hendon, as you do. I'm trying to get into this um, parking space on, on Bell Lane. I'm just getting in the space and this guy, bang, reverses and smashes my car. I'm like, oh, no. Right? I get out. And straight away he's like, what happened? You know, he's trying to blame me, right? Yeah, he smashes me and it's my fault, right? He says, what happened? Whose fault was it? So I say, Hashkacha Protest, divine providence. It was God's fault, blame God, right? I couldn't be bothered to say it was his fault. And he was really upset about the scratch. He had this tiny little, my car was totally dented, right? It's <laughs> smashed to smithereens, right? He had this tiny little scratch and he's like rubbing off his scratch, like, you know, crying that, you know, you know, life's not going to be the same because it's a tiny little scratch. My, my car's been smashed, right? And, and but, the, but I, I really don't care. I mean, I'll be honest, maybe I'm a bit extreme, but I always think if you'd, when I'm in the car, I can't see the outside of my car anyway. What do I care? You know, I just want to, <laughs> that's my thinking. I just want to get from A to B, to be quite honest. And as long as it works, I'm cool, right? But I think some people can go extreme on the other way. And it's like, oh, it's my everything. It's like, it's like my pet. It's not, it's a car, you know, and, and, and you can't take your car with you in the next world. And some people have that same love for their house. You know, I was lived in a house for probably 15 years, very beautiful years in my, my, my family's life. Three of my kids born in that house. We left the house, it meant nothing to me. My family means something to me. The house was a house. That was the environment that Hashem enabled us to live for a while. You know, the bricks and stones are bricks and stones. Hopefully you're able to elevate them and, and do mitzvahs there. But you don't have to fall in love with a house. You don't have to fall in love with a car. You're meant to fall in love with your family. You're meant to fall in love with goodness. You're meant to fall in love with Judaism. You're meant to fall in love with God. And if you fall in love with God, then you're prepared to go that extra mile. Then you're prepared to learn some Torah, even when you're tired, even when you've had a rubbish day, even when it's stressed, even when everyone's shouting at you. But, but learning's learning. You know, my dad continued learning, he had cancer and he was dying and nothing stopped him. Russell Sophie Fingal got Parkinson's and he's shaking like a leaf and nothing's going to stop him. Because it is that important, he don't stop. And that's what Hashem's saying. If you want to grow and receive the Torah on Saturday night and become spiritually excellent and, and inherit those 310 worlds, it's not going to be easy. You've got to do superhuman effort and here's the... Here's the the idea, if you are superhuman with your effort, then you get supernatural blessings. That's the way to have a relationship with the divine. Hashem isn't constrained by the finite. When we can get out of our finite and we can find superhuman actions, that's when we become superhuman. That's when we can allow ourselves to have that beautiful relationship with Hashem and share in those 310 worlds. We get the 310. Hashem gets the 310. That makes the 620 of those spiritual lights that, please God, we can bring to the world. May Hashem give you all the beautiful gift of the Torah this, this Saturday night. And Hashem should give the whole of the world peace and oneness. And please God, Mashiach should come very soon in our time. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Any questions from anyone here or anyone on Facebook? Anyone's got a question? Happy to take a question. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you,